The question is that this House has considered preventable site loss. I call John MacDonald. Thank you, Mr. Mark. Can I congratulate my friend for securing this debate? And I thought that was a comprehensive but detailed and succinct assessment of where we're at. Sometimes the role of uh, members of Parliament is to identify an issue before it comes into crisis so that we can then advise government on the action that's needed. That's exactly what my honourable friend has done. Um, when, this, when some of my constituents identified the, this topic as an, as an adjournment debate, um, they approached me to raise a particular issue that I've been dealing with, to be frank, for the last 20 years, which is the issue that group of people who've had their eyes damaged, their eyesight damaged as a result of re reflective eye surgery or laser treatment, as some, some know. Um, the, the refractive eye surgery sector operates now in what is um, a huge profit-making industrial se sector. Um, many gain through the use of refractive eye surgery um, and their eyesight is benefited. But there are many more, in fact thousands every year now, um, whose vision is damaged as a result of the surgery itself. Um, many years ago, a campaign was launched by a woman called Sasha Rodai. Some people will know if, if, um, if they've in any way dealt with these laser treatment issues. Um, she's a heroine. She, um, each year, I work with others to organise a lobby of Parliament. She runs the campaign called My Beautiful Eyes. Um, every year, we have a lobby which is called Bad Eye Day. And we bring together um, those individuals and their families whose eyesight has been damaged um, by this type of surgery. Um, when I say damaged, to the point for many of them where their eyesight is nearly lost. Many others have had heartbreaking stories of where they've lost their employment and also where they've been severely disabled. Um, 20 years ago, um, I support in 2004, Frank Cook, who was a uh, Labour MP then, brought forward a piece of legislation, a private member's bill, which looked at the issues which were confronting those people whose eyesight had been damaged in that way. And it was a bill which I sponsored as well, and it was basically calling for regulation of the sector. In 2013, I produced a 10-minute rule bill which reflected many of the issues that... Um, and proposals that Frank Cook had put forward. And we've had debates, we've had meetings with the Royal Colleges, and we've had ministerial meetings as well. All throughout that 20-year period, we were asking for is greater regulation, effective regulation, basically. But we've had such limited progress. Um, even the government's own inquiry into cosmetic surgery in the, at that inquiry, Sir Bruce Keogh actually identified laser surgery as an issue that should be the subject for further regulation. But to be frank, nothing has followed on from all those ministerial meetings, all those debates, all that legislation we put forward, and also the government's own inquiry. Um, what we need is effective regulation, and it runs through the whole range of aspects of the process. The first is the marketing and advertising of this, these treatments. <clears throat> Sasha Rodai, and I quote her, said, the industry is notorious for making outlandish claims about the effectiveness of this surgery. <coughs> In fact, on a few occasions, we have taken um, companies to the Advertising Standards Authority, and they've been found guilty of exaggerating their claims about what this treatment does. The second is we wanted regulation <clears throat> of the advice that's provided to people who come forward to commission the surgery itself. And it's about appropriate advice, about whether the individual's eye is actually appropriate for this type of surgery. And what we found at one stage was that the advice that was being provided was by members of staff who were not qualified. They were simply selling the product itself. And again, what we wanted is the the regulation and supervision and monitoring of the provision of advice, but we also wanted the supervision and monitoring of surgical practices and professional standards. 
I have to say there's been a number of cases that I've dealt with where the professional standards have fallen below those that we would have expected. And as a result of that, people have been harmed. And when things do go wrong, often the company will fail to put adequately things right. They'll delay their response, often delaying trying to get beyond the, a legal limit for when legal action can be taken. And what then happens is these individuals then have to fall back on the NHS. And what we're finding is time and time again, it's the NHS that is having to address complex injuries as a result of the laser treatment. And yet the financial burden falls on the NHS, not on the companies themselves. So we've argued in the past that, first of all, we should publish, there should be a publication of the records of performance of those individual private companies. And yes, if necessary, actually, the publication of the records of the, the surgeons involved, identifying where there has been harm caused as a result of the action that's been taken. And where there is NHS involvement that's needed to correct or address the com concerns that people have been left with, then maybe there should be a levy on those private companies so the cost burden doesn't fall on the NHS. All of these things, as I say, this is 20 years on since that first piece of legislation. Frank Cook brought it forward. If I recall rightly, he brought it forward because he'd gone through that experience as well and was interviewed by the media about it, and then all of a sudden received a flood of correspondence from people saying the same things happened to me, the same sort of injuries have taken place. And then when I raised it in 2013, literally hundreds of emails coming in. As I say, we have this national lobby each time. And some of, this, some of the stories are heartbreaking, absolutely heartbreaking about what's happened to people as a result. So one of the things I'd request of the Minister, if, it, if it's possible, I, I know there's demands on, on his time, but, but I think it would be really useful if he, like some of his predecessors did, is meet with um, some of the victims of this refractive eye surgery, meet with the victims who have become campaigners and some of the professionals that they work with so that we actually can address the current situation, have an objective overview of where, where we're at at the moment, but then agree a programme for reform. Because all people are asking for is adequate regulation based upon monitoring of the professional practices that are taking place at the moment so that people feel protected. Because at the moment, Exactly as my honourable friend has said, um, there's, eye, there's a real risk of eyesight loss. And there's nothing, I think there's one, one of the worst things that can possibly happen to people where they become completely isolated from the world then. It is incredibly distressing. Final point for me as well, it does fit in with the demand for an overall national eyesight strategy, which is desperately needed. I concur. What, what my honourable friend has described as happening across the country is happening in most of our areas as well. And there's a fear now that if we don't address it now, we could be in a crisis situation very, very quickly as a result of the loss of professional staff to the NHS in particular. And also the point my other honourable friend made, the postcode lottery of access to those services as well. I'm hoping that the Minister will agree to the meeting with the, the campaigners around this particular issue because I think it's worth addressing so that at least they can have their say and the Minister can take advice on the reform programme we need. Okay, uh, thank you. Now we